Okay, good morning. I'm Lanny Job, and welcome to the very first live stream of the Blackwell Church of Christ for our worship service. We want to welcome on board the Agape Church of Christ in Ponca City today. Their preacher is on vacation, so uh, thank you for being here with us. There's also many other numerous Christians I know about that have said they're going to tune in, uh, even from Texas, Arkansas, and Kansas. So we welcome everybody to the Black World Church of Christ. Our first time to do this. This has been a historic week, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, using this technology even beyond all of this coronavirus scare and the things that we're seeing going on around us right now. This is technology that we can think of opportunities that God can bless us with. Of course, many of you know the elders made the decision for us here at the Blackwell Church to follow the CDC guidelines of gatherings of 10 or more. We're restricting those. No public services until April 5th. That's subject to change. You can check back with blackwellcoc.com or our church members can look at our Facebook page to get any updates. We do hope that on April 5th we're able to physically gather together and assemble and worship God with all the things that we know uh, glorify Him, our singing, our praying, our having our Bible classes, our preaching, our, our giving, all those things as we worship Him together. I also want to personally invite everyone that is watching, please uh, plan on being here for Easter Sunday, April the 12th. This is one of our big events, and it's going to be followed by an Easter egg hunt. I want to give a hopeful message about the resurrection of Christ, and we are delighted to have you. Please come if you can. Um, also, today's live stream will be broadcasted at 2 o'clock. We hope to have that online at blackwellcoc.com. Or you can check out our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel can be located by simply searching for Blackwell Church of Christ. You can subscribe if you'd like to. If we have a 1,000 or more subscribers, we would be able to also live stream on that format as well from our mobile phone. So please check that out. If you don't want to subscribe, that's fine. You can still watch that sermon, this sermon that we're going to have, this message, as well as some archive sermons. Today's live stream is going to include a communion service led by one of our new deacons, Terrell Hankins, as well as a scripture reading by our youth minister, Jacob Sanford, and a scriptural, spiritual message from God's Word. Um, for our Blackwell Church family, let me just remind you of a couple of prayer requests. I know that Melba has put some of this out in a bulletin online and emailed some things to our church family. But yesterday, Geraldine Winty had to go to the ER. She is uh, at the uh, she's at home now, but according to Maxine, uh, hospice will be coming tomorrow to start caring for her needs. So. Please keep Geraldine in your prayers. Again, we welcome you to this live stream. Would you uh, start with me by bowing your head? By the way, also have your Bibles ready and the communion supplies. If you have those ready, that'll be follow, that will follow this prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. We're asking, Father, that you be with our nation, that you be with our world that we have with all the hurts that are going on, all of the fighting, all of the division, all of the unrest. Father, be with us in regards to the spreading of this coronavirus. May that be stopped. Be with the medical professionals and others that are helping us with those things that are necessary for test kits to be available for people's lives to be spared. We hear more and more every day of confirmed cases of this virus. We now know that some has affected, uh, some in the church have been affected by this. We pray for the AIM student and the Sunset School of Preaching and all that is involved with uh, the work going on there based out of Lubbock. We pray, Father, for others that we know of that are uh, in our church family especially, but we ask that the church will reach out to our communities and whatever ways we can to be safe, but also to minister to people and their needs. Help us to keep the loving spirit alive and hope alive. And Father, be with us throughout the remainder of this service. Most of all, Father, 
We're grateful we serve a risen Savior who died on the cross for our sins but did not stay dead. He arose from the grave as a victor, and we have the victory because of Him, no matter what. Thank you for allowing us to be your church. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Terrell? What is the purpose of communion? To commemorate the death of Christ. The quote, this do in remembrance of me. To signify, seal, and apply to believers all the benefits of the new covenant in the ordinance Christ ratifies his promises. To his people and they on their part solemnly consecrate themselves to him and to his entire service. To be a badge of the Christian profession. To indicate and to promote the communion of believers with Christ. To represent the mutual communion of believers with each other. The scripture that I will be using today is Luke chapter 22 verses 19 through 20. In verse 19 of Luke chapter 22. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We love him and thank him for all that he did for us on this earth and for what he does for us in heaven now. We now ask, Father, <clears throat> to help us to concentrate our minds on his broken body and this bread that represents that broken body. We ask, Father, to please bless it and bless those who partake of it in a manner well pleasing unto thee. We say this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as Lanny mentioned earlier in the week, if you will take your tab, if you'll use your thumb and press down, there is a little at the very top that you can peel back. If you'll just peel that back, and the wafer is right here on top. And you can just take it right off the top and in there. Let's continue. Again in Luke chapter 22, in verse 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks for this cup that represents Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. Again, Father, we ask that you please bless it and bless those who partake of it. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you will take the bigger tab and just peel it back carefully so it doesn't... There. And as you pull it back, Amen. God bless you. Would you please open your Bibles to Matthew six? Verses 33 and 34. That will be the scripture reading for today. So it's Matthew 6, verses 33 and 34. 
It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Thank you, Terrell and Jacob, for helping us today. Uh, again, we're just learning, and next week we're going to be maybe trying a few things, maybe even try a, a few other platforms that will help get this to other people who do not have Facebook. We did research quite a bit. There's been a lot of talk among ministry friends of mine about how this should be uh, done in the right way, and we're just doing the best we can with what technology we know about right now. So again, uh, there'll be maybe some uh, different formats for next Sunday as we also will live stream that service. Go ahead and have your Bibles now open to Philippians. I've chosen Philippians as the book I want to go to because it's a very positive book. And I think right now that's what everybody is asking for, looking for, something positive. I know if you're like me, you're turning on the news, you're watching your Facebook feeds, you're, you're seeing all kinds of things that can be very depressing and discouraging. And I think God does not expect us to live with discouragement in our heart during discouraging times. I believe of all people on earth, Christians ought to be the most joyful. This is going to be a little challenging for me because usually at the end of a statement like that, I'm going to say amen, and I'm hoping you at your home are going to say amen. So let me hear you say amen. I heard it. Good, good job, guys. So Philippians in chapter 4 is where I'm going to be. Uh, all of Philippians, again, one of my favorite books because Paul speaks so much about joy. And we're going to definitely be on a passage this morning that is going to hone in on that joy factor that we need in our lives. These are unprecedented times. I said that earlier in the week. I'm not sure if there's ever been anything like this that has so impacted the church in my lifetime on a global scale. Please know that the church was never meant to be the building. It never was the building. In a Stephen ser sermon that Stephen preached uh, in Acts chapter 7, verse 48, he makes the statement, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, that our bodies are the temple of God's Holy Spirit. I'm reminded of how important it was for for the early disciples to be in their houses because when you, when you read Acts 2, 46 and 47 or perhaps Acts 5, verse 42, you'll see that's exactly where they were. Yes, they were going to the temple courts daily, but they were also going inside their homes to break bread and have the fellowship, just as we are doing today in our homes. I'm also reminded of Paul's letter in, of Romans uh, in the very last chapter where he gives some greetings to various churches that were meeting in people's homes all across Rome. And so today, we are assembling in our homes to worship God because it's not about a building. We're assembling in our homes today to worship God, not because of oppression and not because of fear, but what we're doing today is out of respect for others. It is, in fact, an act of love. Uh, we do not wish to expose anyone who could have high risk to what has already been considered a very deadly virus. It's been proven to be that. Our shepherds here want to cooperate with this global effort in, to inhibit the spreading of this virus. I believe as difficult of a decision this was for them to make, it is the right decision. I affirm that in that decision. Now with that said, let's uh, look at Philippians in chapter 4 and see what God has to say to us today. I'm going to begin in verse 4. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Did you hear that? If there's nothing else you hear or remember from all of what you're going to see today or hear me say, please remember this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. As a matter of fact, as you're gathered with your family or whoever you're with, or even if you're by yourself, would you say this with me online? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. 
And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I want to go ahead and reach down to verse 19 as well as a part of this message. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. I want to tell you that As I've reflected on this passage this this week, there's a lot of thoughts that have come to my mind. And as I mentioned earlier, and I do not want us to lose this perspective, that this is a very positive book. I mean, at the very opening statements that Paul gives in this letter, he says things like, I thank God every time I remember you. And that's awesome. And he goes through some of the things he went through. And in spite of the the trials he went through, he's able to come out and say, uh, but we have reason to be happy we have reason to have joy and and i'm content with what i have because of jesus everything he's saying here is because of jesus because of jesus Uh, we understand that uh, when you look at some of the things personally if you would now let's pick up a a little bit more of the reading in chapter 4 verse 11 where he says i'm not saying this because i am in need i have learned to be content whatever the circumstances whatever the circumstances I know that it is what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or being in want. And most of you know this next part. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. But... By the same token, when we're looking at the positive, the optimism things that are here in the text, I must share with you that on my heart recently, there have been indicting things from this text to us. When I observe what I've done personally, how I've reacted to all that's going on in our current affairs in this world, and what I see my church family doing or my neighbors doing and people in this community in which we live, and I'm sure you've seen some of the same things. If you're on social media, you've definitely seen Places where this ought to resonate in our hearts as an indictment, a reprimand for us. I never thought of this text as a reprimand until this week. But I'm also here to tell you that of the four things that I'm going to bring out of the text that I think are things that we need to really hear, there's also a blessing that follows it. You'll see that's a part of the pattern of this text. That Paul will say, do this, be this, and this is the result This is going to be the blessing that will come to you because of you being this or doing this. So the four things that I have, I'm going to start with number one, is this. We have forgotten to focus on God. I truly believe that myself even, I have forgotten to focus on God. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. That's what he said. In every situation, rejoice in the Lord always. Always, and he's so emphatic about it. Again, I say, rejoice. Let me tell you something I heard Max Lucado say earlier in the week. We need to feed our faith and starve our fears. When we feed our faith, we will starve our fears. But when we feed our fear, that will starve our faith. We need to feed faith. The way we do that is not focusing on me, not focusing on us, but focusing on Him. I believe God is talking to us today. He has something to say to the world, and He has something to say to His church. We have lost our focus. I know you think, well, this passage is about being happy. That's right. We'll never find that happiness, though, when we're focused on ourselves. Because the determining factors of ourself, if that's the source of our joy, will be like an emotional roller coaster. We'll be up and down. But God is solid. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is our constant true source of joy 
That's why Paul could say, rejoice in the Lord always, no matter what. That's why James could say in James 1, 2, count it joy when you fall into various temptations or, or trials. I believe that we have forgotten to focus on God. But the blessing with this is in this text. Did you see it? Ending of verse 5. According to Paul, the blessing will be the realization that God is near. Of all people on earth, the children of God ought to express the most joy. We ought to be the most happy. And it's because we know God is here. Just as He is today as we're assembled in in various homes, even as a part of us are here at the building where two or three are gathered, God is near. God is with us. Now that can be comforting. It can also be sobering because He also is present when we are flying off the handle, when we have feelings of disenchantment, holding grudges and saying unkind words and being on social media and being immature. God is near for that too. It ought to be because God is near or the fact that we can focus on God and that's the product, that's the, that's the blessing we have is, uh, of knowing that when we're happy and we're excited and we're glad and we're enthusiastic, we have this peace that transcends all understanding. God is near. That is awesome. Number two, we have forgotten to go to God. We have forgotten to go to God. Paul has said in this text that in everything, make your request, your petitions known to God, your thanksgiving in every situation. Those are the words that he used. Whether things, whenever things don't go the way we want, we're quick to seek out the store manager, that city official, that school board member, or perhaps even that elder in the church to lodge our petitions and our complaints. We take our grievances to Facebook rather than the Almighty. We send out invites to our pity party via live stream, just hoping for some validation and justification for our rants. And we must stop that. God is saying you're going to the wrong people, you're going to the wrong places. He wants us to go to Him. We have forgot the first step. Go to God first. The the scripture that Jacob read just a moment ago tells us that. In in the midst of a context, by the way, where Jesus is teaching His disciples, do not worry about your life, what you'll drink, eat, or wear. God's going to take care of us is the lesson. And He's saying at the end in verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God. And these other things are going to be added to you, but put God first. And we have not put God first. We have forgotten to focus on God. We have forgotten to go to God first. And third, we have forgotten to live for God. By the way, the blessing for going to God is found in verse 7. According to Paul, the blessing will be that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Number three, we have forgotten to live for God. We have forgotten to live for God. When you look at verses 8 through 9, it's Paul's criteria for a godly life. We need to bring back the right criteria that sets us apart from the world. We're supposed to be different, a distinct people, a holy people, a holy nation, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9. We need to surrender our lives to what's really normal, not what's the new normal according to the world's standards. Normal means standard. Listen again to these words coming all from verse 8. And as I say these words, I want you to ponder on them. Think, let that soak in. Let them be something on your heart. Not just today, not just for this moment, but for the rest of this week. It'll change your life, I promise you. True. Noble. Right. Pure. Lovely. Admirable. Excellent, praiseworthy. This is how we should be thinking. Not what everybody else is thinking, certainly not what the celebrities are thinking. This is how we are to think godly. And Paul says, whenever you've heard me say this, whenever you've heard me do this, and you've seen this in me, you do this too. He says, put it into practice All these things that constitutes godly living. We can start with our attitude. It goes with how we act towards others. Instead of hoarding, let's help. 
Let's be a people that think of others better than ourselves. Jesus said that all men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And yet, I am ashamed to say that even among our Christian community, we have fussing and fighting over legality issues. Should we meet together? Should we not meet together? We're forsaking the assembly or this, that, and the other. There's all kinds of biting and devouring, and it's got to stop. That's not living for God. And that says no good thing about us as the people of God to the rest of this world. God has you in mind. He has me in mind as a strategic billboard to express the love of Jesus Christ, His Son. And the blessing is for following this, to live for God. The blessing is found in the end of verse 9. According to Paul, the blessing is the God of peace will be with you. We have forgotten to uh, focus on God. We have forgotten to go to God. We have forgotten to live for God. Fourth, we have forgotten to depend on God. When you look at Paul saying, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content, it's something that didn't come easy for him. He had to learn it. And of all the people you can think of, Paul is certainly one of the best examples to go to to see a guy who's been kicked around all over the Roman Empire like a football. He knew what it was to go without. He knew what it was to be destitute, to starve, to hunger. He knew what it was to suffer physical pain because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And he said in every situation, no matter what, in all circumstances, he was able to transcend his disposition beyond the circumstances. If there's one thing I've learned about myself this past week in this self-induced state of quarantine, it's this, how ridiculously spoiled I am. Now, if you're saying amen, I hope you're saying that of yourself, not for me. We have forgotten about the basic, most important basic necessities of life. Dare I mention toilet paper, loaves of bread. My rent is about potatoes. I've gone to the store five times now, and there are still no potatoes in that bin. My, how spoiled we are. What'd they do on the Oregon Trail? What did the early church do during times where they were being boycotted because Christianity had to go underground due to Roman oppression? Again, I say, we are meeting in homes today not because of oppression from our country. We're doing it out of love for the respect of others so that we can get ahead of this virus. But it does remind us, it gives us a little glimpse of maybe, just maybe, scratches the surface of what it was like to go without. We have forgotten about how important some people are. Teachers, doctors, nurses, truck drivers, farmers, emergency response workers. We have forgotten how to do without. We're learning now in my home to ration the milk, the pop, and the salsa. How about you? We're trying to figure out those things that have been luxuries and conveniences, realizing maybe that grocery shopping list is now kind of getting rid of the extra fat there. And that might do us all some good, by the way. But we're also looking at what is the basic staples of what we need. We understand this from our God. He will take care of us. He will provide. Paul has said that in every situation, no matter what the circumstance, I've learned to be content. He learned his dependence to be upon God. And the blessing is this. This is in verse 19, the one that I went a little bit further down to grab a moment ago. And my God will meet all your needs. There's enough resources in this whole world to meet all of our needs, but there's not enough resources in this world to meet all of our greed. I believe Gandhi said that. I saw that on Facebook, so it must be true. But I want, you, I want to encourage you to not put your focus on anything else but our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to go to God first in all things. It'll save your relationships. It'll save your sanity And it'll bring that blessing to you. And let's remember to live for God in our action, our behavior. And let's depend on God as we are doing today. We're dependent on God. Things to remember. Three things really quick. Remember that Jesus taught us not to worry. In the very passage that Jacob uh, read a little bit from just a moment ago, this is the teaching of Jesus back in verse 25. Do not worry about your life. Number two, he taught us not to be afraid. He he asked for us to have faith and to believe. Again, if we feed our faith, that will will, uh, starve the, the fear and the worry in our life. 
Uh, we can transcend beyond the circumstances. I'm reminded of Peter when he's walking on the water. As long as his focus was on Jesus, he's walking on the water. But he took his eyes off of Jesus and started looking at the waves and the wind and realizing that they're in a storm. That's when he sank. And he says, why did you have little faith? Have faith. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Third, Jesus taught us not to ever lose hope. In John chapter 14, Jesus is preparing His disciples for a, a time that He would no longer be with them in person, physically. And He says to them in verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house have many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with Me that you also may be where I am. And in verse 6 he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But then pay attention to this verse in verse 27. And I'll close with this. Jesus saying, Peace I leave with you. My peace, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus taught us not to lose hope. He taught us to think with the end in mind. My friends, wherever you're at, listening to this sermon, watching this sermon, let me assure you, we win. Remember, we're going to get through this. We're going to be stronger because of this. So let's praise and serve Him in the midst of this, shall we? May God and His grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That's how He closed this portion. May God bless you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.